Welcome to Centropolis, an ongoing conversation about books, ideas, and characters with character in our world. We have one of the most interesting and influential characters of our time with us tonight, Mike Allen. Mike's playbook column, email, blog on Politico, the website he co-founded, is said to be what the president reads when he gets up in the morning, what Katie Couric reads in bed, and what Joe Scarborough reads even before he gets his morning coffee. Mike, how does it feel to be the most influential journalist in America? Well, Crosby, uh, thank you very much for your hospitality, and we like to think of Playbook as part of a good breakfast, so thank you very much. I had my late breakfast this morning at Arthur Bryant's. Uh, oh, right. Uh, went for the two meat platter. That is a real breakfast. Ate some uh, french fries off David Von Reilly's plate, so. That is a Kansas City breakfast. We're proud of David for leading you, uh, leading you to that. Um, well, you know, the, Politico is, uh, has, has achieved this incredible prominence in the Beltway and the political world, uh, but it had kind of an offhand start, if I understand. It really was out of your emails. Is yeah, that right? uh, Crosby, that's right. Uh, Play, uh, Politico and Playbook started uh, with just two friends, uh, John Harris, who I worked with in Richmond 30 years ago, back when we uh, covered, remember the great, good old days, Doug Wilder, I Chuck do. Robb, uh, all that delicious uh, Virginia politics. Politics, exactly. So I used to call uh, John Harris my oldest friend in Washington. Now that we're actually old, I call yeah, him my longest friend yes, in Washington. Yes. And Jim Van De Hei, those two guys were working together at the Washington Post. And 10 years ago uh, this uh, fall, they had the radical idea, what if we did a website just about politics? What if we gave people coverage that was better, faster, and uh, they could just get their fix in one place? And there were a lot of skeptics, but they were kind to take me along on that adventure. Uh, so just three of us hatching it in Jim Van De Hei's uh, sunroom and Lake Barker. And you're kind of sell, sending emails to your friends at, 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 at that point, and now it's it's huge. How many how many people are getting Politico today? Do you? Yeah. So uh, Crosby uh, uh, Politico Playbook now has an audience of 100,000 or so, and Politico itself grew from those three people to we now have 460 colleagues around the world. So we have newsrooms uh, in Northern Virginia, in Brussels, in Albany and uh, also in Florida, New Jersey, and we have colleagues in California, Massachusetts, Illinois. So we're giving uh, that uh, Politico dose to people everywhere, people who want faster, uh, more complete coverage, and it's uh, part of a trend toward more like specialization in media. Right, and and it, it's said to be uh, the 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 uh, ins where the insiders go to find out what the other insiders know. But but to some extent, you're replacing the Washington Post, the the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. At least they're trying to keep up with you. I get I get emails regularly during the day from all three of you, from Politico, from the the Journal, and the and the and the New York Times. But you're not doing exactly the same thing. But you're you are replacing a big part of what they do, the political coverage, aren't you? No, Crosby, you're exactly right about that. And our uh, theory has always been we uh, run Politico from what we call the inside out theory. And the inside out theory is that when we worked at Time Magazine or the New York Times or the Washington Post or in Jim's case, the Wall Street Journal, our job was to take what we knew and translate it for our moms, uh, for people uh, who um, are smart and interested but weren't uh, super into the news. We do the opposite of Politico. We write very deliberately for the senator, for the chief of staff, for the campaign manager. And the theory of Politico is that if you're telling the White House chief of staff, Dennis McDonough, something that he wants to know or needs to know or that makes his life better, then there's going to be a big, almost voyeuristic audience around the country sure. that's going to want in on that they want to know what you've told him, but they also want to know what he's probably telling you because he's uh, expecting to get some messages out through you. That's right. And so a big conversation. We like to think of uh, our morning uh, email. We like to think of it as what it'd be like for us to have breakfast together. And 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 I like that. The what 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 would it be like for us to have breakfast together? Because there's also a feel to Politico that's very different from the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Washington. Post, it feels a little bit more like a small town newspaper in a way. It feels a little bit like the newsroom from one of those 30s or 40s uh, uh, movies uh, uh, about newsrooms, about uh, n the newspaper, the old fashioned newspaper where somebody's rushing around, so, which I think is partly your personality, is, is, 
is what's shining through. I'm sitting through. I'm chilling the, out, the, like I'm the, just very now, now, to, For our, our audience who might not know the Mike Allen story, Mike is, is, is said to be the most frenetic, the most engaged uh, yeah, look, man I'm, in, I'm in just... Washington, uh, said to be doing his 2,000 emails, replying to his 2,000 emails in the middle of the night uh, and, uh, and waking up uh, to give everybody their 5.30 uh, a.m. Uh, news. So, how, how do you see the, the doing the news? You, you, you obviously you talk to Dennis McDonough, and uh, mm -hmm. but you also you, you you talk to people in the street. You talk to uh, uh, your friends. You, you Politico has a has a unique feel to it because you discuss not just the news, but you discuss the lives of the people you're talking about and your friends, particularly in Playbook. You, you've got this long list of birthdays, whose birthday it is, or uh, where you saw uh, Senator, what, what, what was in Senator Cornyn's basket at Whole Foods, which was cantaloupe, by the way. Very healthy eater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, th th what's the feel you're going for, or is it just natural? Is it just what you do? Oh, uh, Crosby, thank you for asking about that. And we do have a very conversational tone in is a big part purpose of Portico in general and playbook in particular is to connect people that there are so few places in uh, Washington especially where Democrats and Republicans are going to get together where hacks and flax uh, where reporters and operatives uh, will get together and one thing we try to do is create a community for people who've maybe worked together on past campaigns or have debated each other on cable TV and helping people understand what's on each other's mind, know a little bit about them as people. It's tougher to attack somebody or misunderstand them if you know a little bit about them as a person. So, so we you, try to do the human side so, as well. So, so I, you know, I want to be a little skeptical about this because we're we're we're, we're living in the age of uh, Bernie and Donald and and uh, and the collapse of uh, of uh, bipartisanship uh, in in Washington. So you're you you're, you're, you must be struggling against that in 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 some way. Do you find that there are people on both the right and the left who are happy to happy to hear from you every day and give you things every day, or do you find some resistance? Too? Oh well, uh, no, uh, Crosby. Let me be clear. We haven't uh, you know. Uh, Washington or brought the, the Capitol back together. I think that someone is going to do that in the future, Cross, because you look at every single poll. Voters want Washington to work. People want the two sides to come together. You can remember the stories about uh, George W. Bush when he was governor of Texas, worked with Democrats. That was authentic. Remember when one of the reasons, there were lots of reasons people voted for President Obama, but one of them was that people thought he was post-partisan. Remember that? Oh, I, then, do, I do remember that. It, it, it lasted in Washington about three minutes. Exactly. So yeah. I'm not saying we've solved it, but uh, we try to be a small oasis in the morning to bring people together. I brought my copy of, of Tocqueville, Democracy in America. And in Democracy in America, he says democracy, is the, uh, the basis of democracy, the salvation of democracy, the foundation, he says that there are three things. Uh, he says newspapers, associations, and religion. Now, we probably won't get into religion here, uh, though I would be interested in your view. But newspapers have gone away, essentially. I mean, they're, they're, the Kansas City Star is on a lifeline here in Kansas City. Talked about the the, the post, but in, but in general, the the news uh, the news business has become the internet, uh, and you are a big a big part of it. But it's changed the news business too. There, the institutional background and what what uh, constitutes analysis, what constitutes ongoing stories. I mean, you tell tell us about people's birthdays. Are you also able to tell us? about what's really going on with immigration, uh, not, not just what Donald Trump has tweeted about it today, which is a big part of the, the, uh, the Internet universe. Does Donald but, Trump tweet? Does Donald Trump tweet? Um, you know, I, I, Mike, I've got to tell you. Yeah. Doesn't always have great spelling. S sad. But Yes, sad, and fre uh, frequently, but, but uh, frequently overnight yeah, too. Yeah, I mean, and I guess what I'm really asking the real question here is, how do you feel about the accusation which Politico gets periodically that compared to a, the traditional newspaper, particularly a Times or a Post or a Journal, uh, it's superficial? Yeah, uh, Crosby, the opposite is the case. Uh, Politico, which uh, has uh, 460 uh, people around the world, uh, larger than any um, of the great. Um, uh, newsrooms uh, throughout the country used to be. Um, that includes a hundred policy journals. So in addition to Portico.com, what you would see on our website if you were to go there, uh, we also have Portico Pro, which is half the revenue from our company, which makes for a very strong business. And that's 14 
policy verticals, uh, reporters who just specialize in depth. Uh, and we started with energy, technology, healthcare, and the most recent ones are uh, e-health, cybersecurity, and employment. And in, in between, we have trade and agriculture and um, defense. So uh, because we have such a solid business model, we are able to have reporters covering those in a depth that was never seen even the, in the golden age right. of newspapers. So it's what you're saying, that business models are changing, that news organizations are adapting, and with that subscription service, we're able to have the deepest, most substantive coverage of anyone in Washington. So, and, and I, I subscribe to some of these. I, I, I read Thank you some, very much. some of them, and, and you're right. There's lots of depth there. But what people are going to, what, ah, what now the that's president's, president's reading in the morning, what Katie Couric is reading in, in bed, uh, uh, is, is playbook. And, and there's, we get the birthdays and the Senator Cornyn at the, at the, at the market. Um, and well, those, uh, and those, those are the, the those are the appetizers of the dessert. Okay. That's not the main course class. Yeah, but so, so my and question then is, are, are people st uh, staying for dinner? Um, yes, but we start with dinner. Uh, we always start with the news, uh, help people understand what's going on and why, uh, what happened overnight, what's uh, happening uh, that you don't know, that people don't want you to know, what's going to happen. So we always start with that. We always start with the news and um, what's important. Uh, we have the most important readers in the world, and we want to make sure that we make good use of their time. If we were uh, dominating uh, their uh, coverage with uh, people shopping baskets, we wouldn't keep those uh, readers very long. So um, it's uh, meat and potatoes, and then sprinkled in, we have a little bit of Whole Foods, and at the bottoms, if you care for them, and most people do, there are birthdays. Yes, okay, well, I, 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 am, I am glad for the birthdays myself. Uh, so now let's talk a little bit about the quality of the analysis, and, and, and here I wanna talk about the associations uh, as the, as the and, and political parties as part of what Tocqueville talks about as the uh, foundation of, uh, of democracy, and we've lost the two political parties, haven't we? I mean, Donald Trump was not a Republican, not, it's not clear what his political views are, actually. And Bernie Sanders wasn't a Democrat. And Bernie Sanders is a socialist. Now, I, I will say, uh, you know, I've read a lot of socialist polemics over the years, and I, I've never read that free college was the, was the root of social, uh, a social, uh, socialist doctrine or even social democratic doctrine, but it's good to know that it is today. Um, it, what's happened to the parties in, in this country, and does, politi does Politico have a view of, uh, of that, and will they come back? Are they res can we resuscitate them? Uh, sure, and uh, we've seen already the seeds and signs of that, but uh, we're going through a time when people are saying to people like me, Washington pundits, Washington parties, uh, people on both sides very, very unhappy uh, with what they see happening in Washington, and that's why you saw the strength of Sanders. If you look at how much money Bernie Sanders raised, you can see really how much unhappiness there is out there, and you take uh, Donald Trump, and so much of that is not necessarily uh, because they love Trump or not necessarily because they um, uh, agree totally with his uh, platform, which uh, doesn't seem to be terribly fully uh, formed uh, as yeah, you and I talk I, I, exactly. in the summertime. Uh, it's because they are unhappiness with what they have now, and they say, let's burn it down and try again, and you're right, that's what's happening. So, so you know, one of the interesting things about the two conventions, and you talked a little bit about this, you've done, done some convention reporting, including from the floors of the con convention. It, uh, the two, two of the, the most prominent speeches are obviously the president's speech, which basically said, um, it's morning in America, he sounded like Ronald Reagan, and Donald Trump's speech, uh, which said it's midnight in America, and all watch is your wallet. All is well, watch your wallet, and it's all is lost without me. And Yuval Levin says in in his new book, The Fractured Republic, that it's true about this country that it's always getting better and it's always getting worse, and they're happening happening simultaneously. And there's always somebody ready to tell you which one uh, is really. Yeah, he talks in there about the age of anxiety, age and of, that definitely is what Donald Trump is playing. And, and, and I know in, in that in the, the there's one overlap in the two platforms. Forms, which is the the uh, uh, the trade uh, agreement, the the TPP, um, uh, in which the, both the uh, parties seem to be in agreement. Both candidates and Bernie uh, certainly seem to be in agreement that we shouldn't have free trade, and yet a majority of Americans are in favor of free trade. What's what's going on? What is that? What is the the Trans-Pacific Partnership really about? Yeah, well, that came uh, a lot from their appeals to their base uh, voters and. 
uh, Trump, uh, who's had a lot of appeal to people who have lost uh, work uh, overseas and uh, is very strong through um, what's often called the Rust Belt. Hillary Clinton. That, that would be us right here, but I don't think he's going to do that well right here. But go no, it's ahead. funny. We're, no, we're talking off camera about the fact that like this particular uh, district uh, definitely isn't a Trump heavy area. And he might carry Missouri. That's 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 possible. He almost certainly will carry Kansas, though there are a lot of unhappy campers out there, mm. including if, me, a longtime Republican. I'm not voting mm. for him. But if you look at where Donald Trump is strong, it's a little bit of a key to your answer about trade. And I agree with you. Uh, it's surprising. It definitely is not where the Clintons have been historically. It definitely is not where the yeah, Republican she helped Party write it, didn't she? I, you has know. been. Uh, uh, so you're absolutely right about that. But if you, if you look at where. He's strong. You talk to the lawmakers from Michigan. They say Donald Trump could well win Michigan. Donald Trump won in the, this is an amazing fact, uh, Crosby, in the Republican primaries, Donald Trump won every county in Pennsylvania, that big, important, diverse state. Right. Now, of course, that's a Republican, Republican primary, side. but it shows he also the won opportunity for it. Every county, I think, he, uh, uh, in every congressional district anyway, in both uh, Connecticut and Massachusetts, he won in Greenwich. Uh, which again is really surprising. The Land are, Rover capital of America. Land Rover capital of America. The sophisticated. And they're all employed in Greenwich, I think. You know. Uh, um, and he won every county in Florida except for Marco Rubio's home county, Deep. Yeah, that's that's stunning, stunning too. So I, it, you know, it, I think there's something unique about Donald Trump. But it, it's my, my, I guess my real question is: Are we seeing a change in American politics that, regardless of who wins uh, this this time out, will affect every future election? Are the parties? Uh, essentially up for bid to, uh, to to people like Trump or or like Bernie who come come completely outside of the traditional uh, uh, confines of the party and to disrupt them. Well, is that is that going to go on? No, like I think that that's a fascinating idea, and um, we'll see uh, how it plays out. There's a lot of uh, people who ran uh, this year in the Republican Party who would uh, like to take it back. But something I remind them of that. Uh, whether Donald Trump wins or Donald Trump loses, um, Donald Trump voters are going to be a more important voice than ever because they're either they could be empowered or they could be madder than ever. And so if you care about the future of the Republican Party, if you want to be a candidate in 2020, there's no question that you have to deal uh, with Trump voters. But you made a great point about policy. I also would say that the way the campaigns will run be run is going to change permanently because one thing that Donald Trump did very effectively was show the power of authentic communication. We used to say, oh, the great political athletes are the ones who can really stay on message. No, Donald Trump has a different message all the time, which is why the TV networks eat him up and his competitors got all upset when uh, the uh, Sunday shows and the morning shows would let him call in and do phoners instead of right. actually showing up like they used to. But it's because he had something interesting to say. And if those other candidates had something as interesting to say as Donald, uh, they would be uh, but, on the air too. But, but so, so, Mike, the something interesting he has to say is mostly insults. Sad, that, but true. That's the part that will change, is that uh, I think that uh, in the future, candidates will maybe find a more polished way to do it. But the idea of just being able to get away with a constantly canned message uh, isn't going to work as well as it used to, he showed this power of social media. And what's fascinating about Donald Trump is that he discovered that social media was not only effective with his followers, but social media was effective because he can take a tweet and drive CNN for hours, days, if it's a picture of Heidi Cruz, uh, for weeks. So, so, so exactly. And it is... So now I want to shift back to where, where, we, where we started, which is the nature of the change in the, uh, the news business. Do you feel manipulated by this as, the, as one of the founders of Politico? Because it's, it's Donald Trump 24-7 at Politico. Not on, no, uh, I'm just going to uh, take that back. That In fact, that's not the case. That at Politico, um, what we have 24-7 coverage of is energy, health care, technology, Agriculture, trade, defense, what, transportation. When I get those e emails energy, from you in the, middle, in the middle of the night, or you know, uh, most of them uh, seem to me to be about uh, two things. One, one is something outrageous Donald Trump has said, or somebody has shot somebody somewhere in the world, and we're wondering whether or not it was a terrorist attack. Okay. Well, uh, I appreciate uh, that you uh, read Politico, and I appreciate we read the, the exact the emails that you're talking about are not from Politico. We cover those things and Trump, and okay. Trump is important. Okay. He's a major nominee of the party, but but. but what I'm saying is that there is still 
a market for quality coverage. And the fact okay. that uh, uh, Politico... No, you, you have great coverage. I guess what I'm saying is, it, it seems to me what, what Trump has done, and Bernie, there's a little bit of this in, in, in Bernie as well, because it was such a... I mean, I think he gave one speech during the entire campaign, the same speech over and over again, is, is uh, there, there's a manipulation of the, the media. I mean, tr Trump spent no money. He had no organization, but he had the whatever the number we've decided it is now, the $3.7 billion worth of free media. Um, it seems to me that I feel manipulated by it. Uh, obviously, I'm, is, you don't agree. No, I'm, I'm not. Uh, certainly, there are media that are being manipulated. But what I'm saying is that, like, you're a sophisticated, discriminating user. You have to recognize that uh, uh, the media in general is very difficult to generalize about. So uh, there may be outlets that are being manipulated. There may be uh, outlets that have ceded uh, their footprint to him. But at Politico, and some of the other great organizations, you have uh, constant fact-checking of Donald Trump. Uh, you have very skeptical in coverage of Donald Trump. Donald Trump has barred Politico from his events. Uh, that's not because we're being manipulated by him. It's because we right. have good, tough, um, aggressive, fair coverage of okay, him. Okay, so, so then the second question is, I mean, there, there, he is a guy who uh, seems to be pretty fast and loose with the facts. Actually, he doesn't seem to have a lot of facts, period. That, again, seems to be mostly insults. Um, how, how does he get away with that? How, how, do, how do we end up here? I, mean, I don't think there's any candidate in American history who has been so devoid of actual policy. I mean, Donald Trump very smartly tapped into an unhappiness uh, out there in the country, unhappiness with Washington leaders, unhappiness with party leaders, anybody with the dreaded E, anybody that you could call the establishment. There's a lot of unhappiness with them. And Donald Trump very smartly uh, figured that out in a way that other candidates could have and didn't. And uh, the establishment uh, did very, very poorly in Republican primaries. So how we got here is that uh, Donald Trump uh, found himself speaking for a lot of people who felt that they were voiceless. And like that proved to be very powerful. But that doesn't mean that the media should uh, give up on it. And that's why uh, Politico, New York Times, Washington Post, other great news organizations out there are fact-checking what Donald Trump is saying, comparing to what he said in the past, comparing it to known facts, and uh, letting readers understand what's out there if they want to. And not everybody, every uh, consumer out there is going to lap it up, but for viewers like yours who clearly are very serious about these issues, that great coverage, that intense coverage is there if they want it. And, and, and so let me, let me put the question in a slightly different way. What we're talking about is, at least in the Republican Party, but if Donald Trump wins, maybe we're talking about it nationally, there's no more establishment. Now, Politico has made its way because you have the best contacts, the most contacts, you're on top of it every day with the establishment in Washington, the Beltway establishment. Well, but but uh, just to stop you there, um, yes, the establishment is important, but also uh, the Trump uh, supporters and campaign are very important. and. We have great contacts there and great coverage there. Uh, I just did an on, on stage interview uh, with one of Trump's top advisors. And uh, similarly with the Bernie Sanders campaign, uh, we had uh, great intense coverage of Bernie Sanders. Uh, we talked to his people all the time. So if you're going to understand politics in America, if, if uh, de Tocqueville were to do uh, his trip now, like talking to Bernie Bros would be very important. Talking to people out there uh, with the cap on that say, uh, make America great. Again, uh, there's no question that if you're sitting in the middle of Northwest Washington, you're not going to have a lot of neighbors who are Trump voters. But that's why it's important to be out around the country. That's why it's such a treat that's why to, to here. be here. It's right. why it's a treat to be here with you in Kansas City. Right. It's why I spend a lot of time traveling because you have to be fluent in what people are saying elsewhere. So yes, you want to be able to understand and explain the establishment to your readers, but you're failing them if you don't also understand these other great forces that uh, clearly are having such a muscle in our politics today. So um, you, you are you, you are uh, exiting Politico. You've had, three, if I remember correctly, 3,300 uh, uh, issues of uh, Politico playbook. And a wake-up. And a wake-up. And, and now you're going on to something else. Can you tell us what you're going on to? Uh, sure. So I'm with uh, Politico uh, through the election. And then after that, I'll be starting a new media company uh, with Jim Vandehei, who is a co-founder of Politico, the former CEO, and Roy Schwartz, who is the chief revenue officer of Politico. 
That's great. And 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 that new venture will do what? Or too soon to tell? Or? Yeah. So uh, we'll be figuring it out. I'm with uh, Politico through the election. Uh, after that, it will be the next great media company. So. Uh, it, you, you've had a, a life in the, in the media that's been incredibly engaged. It, in fact, it's said there's a story about you, which I want to know if this is true, uh, that you were once covering a story, a trial for a couple of uh, different newspapers, and you were hit by a car and, and broke, your, broke, broke something, broke your leg or something, and you still filed the stories before you went to the hospital? Well, embarrassing as it is, uh, yes, that's true. Um, and just to date uh, myself a little bit, uh, this is a little embarrassing too. The reason. Uh, that uh, I was hit by a car was that I was running across a street in Richmond, Virginia to a payphone. Uh, now, some of your viewers won't even remember a payphone, payphone but yeah. uh, we uh, needed to file from a hard line. So I was rushing over there. I was covering a trial of a prosecutor, not by a prosecutor, of, of a, prosecutor. a prosecutor. This is how great yeah. Virginia politics was. This was the Commonwealth's attorney, Joe Morrissey, in Richmond, Virginia, and he later ran for re-election and he had a billboard that said, a prosecutor with convictions. This has been a great pleasure to get to know you a little bit, Mike. Do, uh, in, the, in the world of, uh, of journalism, which you've played such a, a major role, you've maintained some very high standards, and I think we're all very appreciative uh, of that. Thanks well, so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, it's a treat uh, to be with you, and I watched your videos of Meet the Past, so I'm uh, excited to be so here so, for Centropolis. So tonight we're, we're meeting the present, so to speak, and also the future of journalism uh, with uh, Mike Allen of Politico and soon to be a new venture. Crosby, thank you so much.